dear friends of Jesus Christ. Now on the same day, two of them were walking to the village called Emmaus. The same day is, of course, Easter. It's the day that began with the women going to the tomb and finding it empty and being met by this, uh, angels who told them that Christ was alive, as the scriptures had foretold. But when they reported back to the group, the 11, the rest of the company who were followers of Jesus, they dismissed it as idle tales. So now, later in the day, two of them are going back to the village, their village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They, of course, walked, so you could say 21,000 steps. What's fascinating in, in, in reading this account is here we have the most earth-shattering event. And it's told in such simple, story-like ways. Here are these two, maybe a couple, maybe just two friends, they're making their way to Emmaus. And, and one of them is named Cleopas. Now, someone suggested that these names that occur throughout the Gospels are, are a kind of reference point. Fact checks. If you're wondering about the truth of this story, in other words, you, you, you should try to meet uh, Cleopas. He, he lives in in Emmaus, or, or talk to Joseph of Arimathea, who gave Jesus a place to be buried. Or, or you could maybe speak to Simon of Cyrene, who was enlisted by the Romans to carry the cross when Jesus collapsed under it. All, all these details. Paul, in his letter, 1 Corinthians 15, says, now Jesus appeared to at least 500 and most of them are alive, though some have died. And then in Acts 26, he is uh, being interviewed or, uh, by uh, King Agrippa and, and the Roman consul Festus. And, and Paul begins to speak of the, of the resurrection. And, and Festus says, my goodness, man, your, your learning has, has driven you mad. And, and then... Paul responds, as Agrippa knows, what I'm talking about did not happen in a corner. This, this event that we're circling around, this earth-shattering event, has these fact-checkers, these people who can testify that they were there they were part of it. And, and they're discussing, of course, and, and another thing that struck me is here, here they're walking down this road and, and they're going over all that's been happening since, since Thursday, really. And, and it's so natural. I mean, Carol and I do it, I'm sure you do, with, with, with a friend or a spouse. You, something happens in your life and, and you're talking and you're talking and walking. And, and here, these two are going over all of the things that have happened, and then Jesus comes. And we're told they don't recognize him. And, and, I have, you know, and, and they're kept from recognizing him. Now, my, my thought first is, you know, if I went to a funeral on Friday, and I looked at someone in the casket, I would not be expecting him to sit next to me Sunday morning. And if someone did seem very much like that person, I would just dismiss it as a coincidence. But, but th th there's more to it, of course. It, it's, it's that Christ's resurrection body, though it is a resurrected body, it is not like any body. 
that you and I are familiar with. I mean, there are indications, of course, in the story itself. Jesus appears and disappears. He comes into locked rooms. In any case, Jesus comes up to them, asks them what they're talking about, and then Cleopas is, is just amazed that here's a stranger in Jerusalem, the only one, apparently, who doesn't know what has been happening since, since Thursday. And, and so then he begins to explain the, the things about Jesus of Nazareth and, and how he was handed over by the priests to the Romans and, and, and crucified. And then, then there's this, this really gut-wrenching sentence, but we had hoped, we had hoped, that he would be the one to redeem Israel. I mean, they didn't begin, they didn't begin hoping that. I mean, what good could come out of Nazareth after all? But, but Jesus had begun his ministry empowered by the Spirit, and he had done great things, and people had begun following him, and he had done wonders, and, and more and more there were people who were thinking that perhaps God was at work in this man. That the promises made to Abraham, that through him all the nations of the earth would be blessed, that perhaps here was the one through whom all this was to happen. And, and then, of course, he is betrayed, arrested, and the Romans... They snuff him out like a bug. They crucify him. And with his death is the death of their hopes. It's all come to nothing. So it's this disillusionment that you and I need to somehow identify with to understand that there's this setting. They, 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 were, they were without hope. And then Jesus, in response, says, Oh, how foolish you, have, you are, and how slow of heart to believe what all the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? This, this, is, this is sort of the central, the central theme. This, this business about, was it not necessary? It, it, it's one of the things that defines the Christian community. There was a divine must, a divine must behind this suffering. A divine must behind the crucifixion. It had to be that way. Now, unfortunately, Luke does not reference the scriptures that Jesus mentions as scriptures foretelling that the Messiah had to suffer. But the angels say it to the women. Now, Jesus says it to the two on the road to Emmaus. And then later, when he's with the rest of the disciples, he again makes the same point that this had to happen in accordance with the scriptures, the, 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 the law of Moses, the prophets, and then even the Psalms. Now, how, how, what scripture did Jesus quote? What, what did he reference? I have a wonderful book that was written by Richard Hayes. He was a professor in, uh, at Duke, Duke University, and it's called Echoes of the Scriptures in the Gospel. Echoes of the Scriptures in the Gospel. And, and he says, when he reads the Gospels, he sees various angles in, in which they, the, the Gospel writers uh, understand Jesus, and, and, and Luke sees Jesus as redeemer, liberator. And, and when you go through the Gospel of Luke, 
in, 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 in the first chapter, of course, Jesus is named Jesus, and he is seen as the one who will ascend the throne of David. He, he's royalty. He, he, he's, the, he's the descendant of the one who went into the valley and slew Goliath. And then Mary has her song uh, where she jubilantly declares that the child that will be born to her will, will bring down the mighty and lift up the lowly. Then in chapter 3, this same Jesus enters into the wilderness and he encounters the darkness. He encounters Satan and he is tempted by Satan. Then in chapter 4, filled with the Spirit, he declares to the people in Nazareth, that the times have been, have been fulfilled. Then, then, and then he meets the, 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 the man in the tombs, the Gerasene, and, 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 and the devils cry out to him, we know who you are, O Holy One of God. What have you got to do with us? Jesus, Jesus comes as, as, as the liberator, as as the one who, who redeems his people. Now, to speak of Jesus as, as a liberator, and, and of course he made very plain to, to his disciples in his teachings that the kingdom that he was establishing, though it would be in the world, would not be of the world. But, but, but he, would, he would create a kingdom, and he would be the ruler, and he would defeat the enemy. Now, I, I, I tell you, I've been on the road to Emmaus for the last three weeks, ever since Mary asked me to preach. And, and, and I, I'm, I, I keep thinking of how, how, how to understand that, how to unpack it so that it, it speaks to us. And, 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 and one of the things that, that has impressed itself on me, and everyone's in a while caused my heart to burn, is that as, as the liberator, he does not liberate with the magic wand, making everything all better. As the liberator, he, he, he becomes entangled in the evil that infects all of us. He enters into the darkness. He confronts the darkness. And, and he, here, here, I think, it, it's important not to minimize sin. I mean, sometimes, you know, people think of sin in Sunday school terms, and they dismiss it. But sin, revenge, hate, conceit, lust, pride, sloth, anger, you take those sins in the cumulative and they unleash great storms. They are the reason for racism and wars and death camps and all the slaughter and all the, all the sadness that we find in our world. So I, I was reading this, a novel where he said, that the author said, sin doesn't need only to be punished. Sin brings its own punishments. Sin it, it, it estranges from ourselves. It estranges us from family and friends. It estranges us from God. Sin. And, and Scripture says, Christ became sin for us. He, he, he becomes entangled in our sin. Uh, when, when I was... Five years old. I was still living, we were living in Friesland. And Dad and I had gone to see his parents, my grandparents, and a little, little town in Friesland, be God. And uh, there was a Roman Catholic church there, a large one. And, and Dad said, it was around Christmas time, he said, you, you, wanna, you, wanna, you wanna see a, a beautiful Christmas display? because the church was known for its crash and all the beauty. I said, yeah, I'd like that. So we went into the Catholic church, my first time ever in a Catholic church. 
And it was much larger than our church and all these stained glass windows. And, and the crash was beautiful. But you know what? What knocked me, what frankly knocked me off the ground, off my, my feet, was the cross. I mean, it was life size. Jesus, his eyes, his crown, the blood, the agony. It was unbelievable. I'd never seen anything like it. And I said to my dad, why don't we have that in our church? And dad said, we believe Jesus is raised. Now, I wasn't clever enough to say, and I suppose the Catholics don't. <laughs> because because it, 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 it's really not the point. The point is that the one who was raised is the crucified one. The one who is raised is the one who has the wounds to show what he has done to set us free from the one who would separate us from God. Right? I, I, I came across, you know, uh, Fleming Rutledge. Uh, she wrote a terrific book on the crucifixion. I mean, if there are two, if, I mean, the cross is, the, it, it's, it's the center of our gospel. It's the center of our message. It's the center of our lives. Fleming Redlich writes a wonderful book on it. John Stott has a wonderful book on it. But here's what, friend, uh, I just took some, here's what she says. Let's see. She says, the hideousness the hideous God-forsakenness of, of Christ's public execution. So the hideous God-forsakenness of Christ's public execution corresponds or mirrors the soul-destroying nature of sin. If you want to know how ugly sin can get, you can go to the camps you, you, you can go to Auschwitz. You can go to all kinds of places. But the cross is a revelation of the God-forsakenness of sin. And, and then she says this about the cross. Christian thinkers have understood that God in Christ somehow incorporated the entire story of the human race in, his own, in this one truly human person, and in doing so, made us participants in his eternal victory. His death is our death. His resurrection is our resurrection. The cross is both a symbol of God's justice and of God's mercy. We live by the cross. Uh, John Timmer. He, he, he has a sermon where he references uh, Jesus or uh, Paul saying that he went to the Corinthians knowing nothing but Christ and him crucified. And then Timur asks, why not? I want to know nothing among you except Christ and him risen. And then Timur says, because... The resurrection flows out of the cross. The cross does not flow out of the resurrection. It was the cross that becomes the source of our, of our freedom, of, of our being uh, the sting of death, which is sin, has been removed. You know, we, we are to live our lives in the light of the crucifixion, always, always asking ourselves, if, given the crucifixion, given the resurrection, how, how do we live? How, how do we live with each other? How, how, how do we live in the world? How can we bear testimony to this, to this 
citizenship that we have in the kingdom. One of my favorite texts is from, is from Colossians where, 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 where we're told that we have been rescued. Listen, <laughs> m- make this your own if you don't have any favorite t- verses. It, it, Paul, Paul says, we have been rescued from the kingdom of darkness and transferred into the, into the kingdom of his beloved son where we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. Where our future is good. You know, as you grow old, our future is not the grave. Our future is God. I want to say to everybody who's listening to me, and, and, and wherever. When we die, because of Christ, we're expecting a great adventure. Because the one who brings death and darkness no longer has his hands on us. He is our liberator. Right? And then, and then I'm going to finish. Then we're told that they've gotten to Emmaus. What a conversation on that seven mile. They come to, uh, they come to Emmaus, and, he, and Jesus is, is acting like he's just going to move on. And then, of course, they quickly say, oh, Why don't you join us? It's, it's really getting late. So he comes in, and then, of course, they're that. Wonderful little turnaround. The, the the guest becomes the the guest becomes the host. Right? The guest becomes the host. He takes the bread, he breaks it, he blesses he blesses it, breaks it, and gives to them. And in the breaking of the bread, they recognize Jesus. And Jesus disappears, and those two disciples make it all the way back to Jerusalem, in the breaking of the bread, in the breaking of the bread. See, I I think if if you you and I, if we thought of ourselves as combatants, during the week we are combatants. We're fighting evil. We're fighting all kinds of crap that comes our way. Right? And then on Sunday, the troops, I mean, just think of the cars driving in. They're all coming, and who knows what they've suffered during the week. They're all coming, they're all gathering. And they gather so that they may see the breaking of the bread and be reminded that their Christ is Lord of all. So that in the midst of our miseries, we can find comfort and strength and go back into the field for our Lord's sake. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.